questions from the listeners and hosts. Ad hominem attacks are not allowed at number three. Number four, the moderators may stop a debater who is deviating from the main point of the topic. Number five, the affirmative side will speak first. Number six, during the open forum, each speaker will be allowed to answer each question from the listeners and moderators with two minutes, and the other speaker may respond within one minute. Hi, Prof. Ay, sorry. Nakasama pa yun. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, six, uh, self-exclatory naman po yung uh, rules natin ngayon. Uh, pero kanti lang pong ano, kanti lang na clarification kasi may ginag, uh, mayroong suggestion kanina, yung ang two minutes na during during open forum, allowed po na mag, mag-ask questions yung ating mga mga tagapagini. Uh, pero po, limited lang po sa two minutes yung uh, sagot ng kung ano yung uh, tatanungin. At pwede rin mag-respond yung uh, opponent uh, pero within two minutes lang. So, clear na po yun. So, for the introduction po ng ating speakers, uh, i-turn over ko po kay uh, Dr. Tess Termolo. Ah uh, okay. Sige. Our debaters for tonight. Um first I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Eric Ferdinand Badong. He is a Christian apologetic and believes in the five solas of the Reformation. So to enumerate sola scriptura, uh sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christus, uh and soli de gloria. His main areas of intellectual interest are New Testament reliability and textual criticism. He's been awarded as outstanding DJ for three consecutive years. Kaya palang ganda ng bosses niya. And is currently a full-time sales agent support for an Australian registered training organization, a part-time English trainer, editor, and language coach. So our second debater is uh, Mr. Don Paez. Um, he graduated from University of Santo Tomas with a bachelor's degree in AB philosophy and took postgraduate studies in the same school specializing in philosophy of science, logic, and philosophy of the mind. He started his career as instructor in UP Baguio and taught philosophy subjects, particularly metaphysics and logic. He currently functions as a motivational speaker, trainer, performance coach, and financial advisor. He is also a Chief Finance Officer of Humanist Alliance Philippines International, an NGO which advocates humanism through promotion of civil rights, education, secularism, and environmentalism. Okay, Homer. Okay, uh, salamat. Uh, meron pa tayong timekeeper ngayon, siguro si Doc Tess na muna. Uh, pag nag- nag-start na pong mag-speak yung first speaker natin, uh, strictly strictly po natin implement yung uh, time limits natin. So, ang, mag, ang magsisimula po kasi nasa affirmative side siya ay si Sir Eric Badong. Uh, yung yung motion natin, uh, ulitin ko lang. Uh, motion, resolve that the young earth creationist model is scientifically verifiable and a viable alternative to the standard cosmological model. So, Oxford Oregon type po tayo ngayon. And then its debater will be given a total of five, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, opening statement, five minutes para sa, sa tapos 20 minutes sa uh, main discussion, 10 minutes sa cross examination, 10 minutes sa uh, ribata, five minutes close. So, ano po yan? Po yan. Uh, so, first speaker po natin, si Sir Eric Patong. Uh, Imimit ko na po yung aking uh, uh, walang notes. Uh, Sir Eric, you can now uh, proceed to the opening statement. Good evening, um, Homer. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so I'll have my own timer here. I will start it now. Okay, good evening, Homer. Uh, the moderators, Professor John. Um, we have also um, Tess and, and Rick. And of course, to you, Mr. Don Pius. Um, my ministry is apologetics, that's right. Apologetics is from the word apologia, Greek, which means um, defense. I follow the commandment in the Bible, uh, in First uh, Peter 3.15, where it says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So, um, 
I was invited here. I'm not here to win the debate or score points, but to honor God by proclaiming the truth of His creation, as stated in the Bible, and uh, also um, perhaps in the process, edify fellow believers. I believe in the errancy, inerrancy of the Bible, 66 books, including when it talks about the creation of the universe in Genesis um, chapter 1. Um, those who are listening need to hear something that they may not have heard before, because it's only the uh, prevailing cosmological model that's uh, being taught in textbooks, in scientific literature, in television, etc. And, uh, well, we both agree that my, both my opponent and I are not experts. We're both laypersons in this topic, so neither one of us can claim expertise in whatever scientific evidence we're going to present tonight. We did not make the observations and experiments, let alone the formulation of hypotheses and theories. So we're both feeding off information um, available and accessible to everyone, like the Internet, for example. So we will be presenting arguments that are not original, but we're both arguing here using our own starting points and our own assumptions. So the motion, the thesis for tonight, is resolved that the young Earth creationist model is scientifically verifiable and a viable alternative to the standard cosmological model. So we have to define some terms here. When we say viable, it means um, capable of being done uh, with means at hand and circumstances as they are. It's feasible, executable, practicable, workable. When we say verifiable, it means it's capable of being tested, um, fal falsified by experiment or observation. So I'll, I'll put it out there. I'm presenting my arguments from a biblical perspective. So I'm using biblical cosmology as uh, stated in Genesis 1, but it's backed by solid scientific evidence. Um, astronomy textbooks change every few years, but the Bible doesn't. The Bible has always been right and needs no updating. The Bible is his, a history book, actually, among other things. God knows how the universe works because he made it. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Um, the writers of the Bible knew uh, thousands of years before um, secularists did about, the, for example, the spherical shape of the earth. In Isaiah 40, 22, it says... Uh, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Um, we believe that Isaiah was written around 720 to 698 B.C. Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible, in Job 26.10, it says, He has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness, and it's written at around 2000 B.C. In most textbooks, uh, Pythagoras, for example, between 570 to 500 B.C., is credited as perhaps the first person to come up with the idea that the Earth is round. And Aristotle came along 384 to 22 B.C., BC the first to prove that it is so. Um, but, of course, the Bible uh, tells it a lot earlier. So intellectual pursuits are good. I, uh, I like it. I welcome it. As long as the goal, of course, is to know God more. Um, apart from God, we can't have knowledge. Uh, Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, It's the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I reject um, old earth creation views like uh, gap theory, theistic evolution, progressive creation, the age theory, and the framework hypothesis. Um, we call them compromise, compromise views. So uh, I also talk about the standard or prevailing cosmological model, which is the Big Bang Theory, as we call it. Um, and I'll, if I have time, I'll prove that it's both bad science and even anti-science. So is the young Earth creationist model a scientifically verifiable and viable alternative to the standard cosmological model? Well, certainly. And I'll explain how and why in my 20-minute discussion later. However, the debate is really a conflict between... Um, two philosophical worldviews based on two different accounts of the origin of the universe. And I can go further by saying that creation, specifically young earth creation, is the only viable cosmological model of historical science confirmed by um, observation science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Eric Badong. For, for your opening statement. So, sit na po tayo kay Sir Don Pais for his opening statement. Oh, you have five minutes po. Sir Don. Sir Don, our... Sir Don, Sir Don. 
Ang naririnig ko si Rick. Meron ano, meron parang parang Proceed na lang muna tayo siguro. Okay lang ba na papatuloy na lang ni Sir Eric yung ano, yung discussion niya, mag-proceed na siya sa main discussion or should we wait a few minutes na muna? Ano ano ba yung mas ma, mas okay? So discussion okay, uh, na wait natin yung ano ni Don. Ayun lang pala. Sure. Ayun okay. Uh, I think Don na okay. take it if it's okay. Ay, all means, maano na muna daw si Sir Badong habang naayos na yung kanyang connection. So, Sir Badong, you can now proceed with your 20-minute discussion. Uh, I will mute my microphone. Pakimute din yung iba para si Sir Eric na yung mga... Thank you. Uh, okay, then... thank you, Omar. All right, I'll start my time here as well. Okay, so again, um, I'm presenting the young earth. When we say young earth, we're talking about the Christian view of of a biblical cosmology of the origins of the universe. Um, it's a biblical cosmology that I'm presenting. I'll start with the Bible, of course. Um, the literal interpretation of the six 24-hour creation days in Genesis 1 is uh, it's six 24-hour days, um, solar days. The Hebrew word for day there is yom. So if we read the context, it's bounded by both evening and morning, and then there's uh, also a number that accompanies it. So there's no other way to interpret that, but it's um, 20, uh, one 24-hour um, day, so six 24-hour days. So they are numbered days. And uh, there's a usage of the morning and evening. Um, so if we trace the genealogies, because it, uh, most of Genesis is history, from Adam to Jesus cannot be longer than 10,000 years. For example, um, Abraham to David is about 14 generations, David until the carrying away to Babylon, uh, captivity of Jerusalem and the removal of the Jews to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar is about 14 generations. Carrying away into Babylon to Christ is 14 generations. So uh, if you total them all, uh, even according to the calculations made by Bishop Usher, the earth is about 6,000 years old. Um, he even had a, an exact year for the uh, creation of the earth and the universe about 4,004 B.C. So um, I'm going to give my scientific evidence now for my case. Uh, of course, I have to define first what science is. The word science seems to have been hijacked by secularists. Science is actually from the classical Latin word scientia, which means to know, also means state of knowing. Um, now it's defined as, you know, like um, how, do, how we study the natural world using our five, uh, five senses. There's a difference between inspirational science. Um, um, so something, when you say um, operational science is something that we can see, we can test. If it's um, historical science, something that we cannot see. So um, the science that's done in the lab, which includes modern clock tests of special relativity, for example, um, of modern physics, yields reliable, repeatable results that are consistent with, the, with that theory. Um, we have a lot of... Um, um, creationists who are scientists. We have Isaac Newton, of course. He actually wrote more on theology than, than science, about 80, 20 percent, 80 percent more. Uh, we have um, Louis Pasteur and Galileo and, and Johannes Kepler. We have modern-day scientists as well who are creationists like Raymond the Media, the inventor of the first MRI machine. Stuart Burgess, professor of engineering design at Bristol University, designed major parts, uh, spacecrafts launched by, by NASA. All right, so I'm going to start with astronomy as my um, evidence. I'll start with lunar recession. Uh, when we say recession, it's the moon is receding from the Earth. So um, the Earth is spinning more rapidly than the moon is orbiting it. The moon induces tidal bulges on the Earth. It recedes one and a half um, inches every year. So if you run it back, well, you're running back a movie. You run it back 6,000 years, and it would be around 730 feet closer to us, the distance of, between the moon and the earth being 248,000 miles. But you run it back uh, 1.4 billion years, the moon and the earth, 
would have been at the same place at the same time. So that's that's not good for everybody. Second is comets. Uh, comets, uh, we love to see comets in the night sky, but they have a very short lifespan. They only last about 10,000 to 100,000 years maximum. But we still see comets now. Comets are uh, made up of icy materials, and they are blasted away from the nucleus of the comet when it's near the sun, because the sun is hot, of course. When you see a comet, you, when you see the tail, it actually always points away from the sun. So they get smaller and smaller, they lose mass, and of course when they lose mass, they can't go on forever, as they have no new source of new mass, so it just gets evaporated away. When you see comets that uh, have gone behind the sun, usually they don't reappear. They're totally obliterated in one pass. They don't survive. It's like walking into a sauna and it's nice and warm and you see some ice cream cones just starting to melt. You know, they haven't been there very long. Comets are another indication of the youth of the solar system. But secular scientists seem to have a rescuing device for that. They say that, well, they know that comets can't last long. So they figure, well, there must be a comet generator somewhere in the solar system that makes new ones. And they call it the Oort cloud, which is an uh, invented idea that tries to explain why we still have comets in a solar system that's supposed to be uh, billions of years old. The idea is that there's this vast reservoir of potential comets out there orbiting way beyond where we can detect them. And that every now and then, one of them gets thrown into the inner solar system, and it becomes a brand new comet. Well, that's pretty clever, but there's no evidence for it. The only evidence you'll find it for an orbit cloud is in the textbooks. But you won't find it in the actual universe. Next, we have uh, spiral galaxies. Spiral galaxies are beautiful to watch, but not all galaxies are spiral. Some of them have a more elliptical shape, but a lot of them are spiral. Well, these spiral arms, they rotate differentially, which means that the inner portions rotate fast, while the outer, outer portions rotate slower. So what, what would you think then? Is the galaxy would have to be twisting itself up or winding itself up tighter and tighter, which means the spiral structure gets tighter with every rotation. Well, it turns out that in 6,000 years, it hasn't rotated even once. Um, but if these galaxies are billions of years old, it would be a huge problem because they'd be twisted beyond recognition. There was actually a computer sim uh, simulation done by Dr. Jason Lyle of uh, Institute for Creation Research. He's a Christian astrophysicist. astrophysicist. And uh, he uh, wrote a computer simulation to use the actual velocities that they've measured in the galaxies to simulate what they would look like. In one billion years, well, they're totally unrecognizable. You won't see a spiral structure. So this proves that even just after one billion years, you can no longer have spiral arms. So again, it proves that the biblical time scale is right. There are other problems there, but uh, for in the interest of time, I just would skip. Perhaps if there are questions later, I can answer them. Let's also talk about Jupiter's external um, excess internal heat. Jupiter, which is about 10 Earths across, emits twice as much energy as it receives from the sun. Such a process can it last billions of years. It's like taking a potato out of a microwave. It's nice and warm, and it radiates the heat out in space. But it can't do that forever, because it only gets so much energy, so it cools off. For a potato, it doesn't take that long. Jupiter, Jupiter is a much bigger potato. If it's billions of years old, why is it not an icicle right now? The problem is even worse for Neptune, which gives up 2.7 times heat as it receives from the sun. So why is it relatively warm if it's billions of years old? Another um, huge evidence that a lot of creationists use for, to prove the, uh, a young Earth and young universe is the magnetic field decay, the, the decay or the decrease of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, it's, an, it's an exponential decay. Everybody knows, uh, well, most of us know that the Earth has a magnetic field around it. Now this magnetic field around the Earth acts as a barrier to protect us from UV, uh, radiation, a lot of stuff is coming off the sun and it starts behind, besides just light. A lot of this UV light and the high energy um, radiation hits the magnetic field and is deflected to the poles, which is what causes the northern lights and the southern lights. We call them aurora um, borealis, aus, uh, aurora australis. Well, this magnetic field protects the Earth, but studies have shown consistently that the magnetic field is getting weaker and weaker. We are slowly losing the magnetic field. This means it used to be stronger, obviously. There's a limit to how strong it can be, or life cannot exist here. It can actually rip the iron out of your blood. If you made the magnetic field 30 or 40 times stronger than it is now, the heat generated would destroy everything. You could not have life on Earth with a lot stronger magnetic field. You run it back to creation um, week, which is about 6,000 years ago, and it's okay. But run it back a million years, and it's a big problem. Um, 
The magnetic fields of the giant planets like Jupiter and Uranus are consistent with a biblical time scale. Why is Jupiter's magnetic field so strong if it's billions of years old? When the Voyager 2 spacecraft flew past the planets Uranus and Neptune, it measured their magnetic field and confirmed that it's consistent with a thousand of years of decay. Dr. Russ Humphreys, another creationist, is a physicist, um, actually predicted the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune before they were measured by the Voyager 2 spacecraft. And he based his measurements on the age of 6,000 years. The, ma- the measurements made by Voyager 2 were consistent with Dr. Humphreys. That's real science right there. If you want to get the correct answer, you better start with the truth of God's word. Um, secular scientists, of course, were perplexed with that thought that there must be a recharging mechanism that builds up the magnetic fields again. But that, of course, falls under the realm of um, theoretical physics. There's the faint sound paradox, main sequence stars. The sun is a main sequence star. And main sequence stars have a 10 billion year lifetime maximum. If the sun is a main sequence star 4.5 billion years old, about half of its hydrogen would have been converted to helium. As the hydrogen is used up, the sun gets hotter. If the sun has evolved, it is now nearly 40% brighter than it would have been 4.5 billion years ago. So this has consequences, obviously, for the temperatures of the planets. Uh, It is generally believed that even small fluctuations in the sun's luminosity or brightness would have um, devastating consequences on the Earth's climate. Um, there's another one, cons- conservation of angular momentum, which I'll probably just discuss later if I have time. I'm going to go to geology now. We also find polystrate fossils. The word polystrate uh, from the word poly means multiple and straight means the strata. Um, we find petrified trees uh, standing straight up, and they're running through many layers of rock strata. Now think about that for a minute. If those layers are different ages, you've only got two choices. Either the the tree stood there for millions and millions of years and didn't rot or fall down, or it grew through 75 feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. Which do you prefer? So that's uh, also huge evidence for uh, young Earth. And then the Grand Canyon. um, It shows that the geologic time is imaginary. You know, when you visit the Grand Canyon, I haven't been there yet. I want to be there someday. So when visitors go to the Grand Canyon, they hear the usual geological interpretation involving millions of years. We are told, for example, that the horizontal formation at the bottom, the, the Tapiat sandstone, was deposited 550 million years ago, and the Kaibab limestone that forms the rim is 250 million years old. Um, well, interestingly, the Grand Canyon strata extends over about 400 kilometers into the eastern part of Arizona. Uh, there, they are at least 1,600 um, meters lower in elevation. Supposedly, the uplift of the Grand Canyon area occurred about 70 million years ago, hundreds of millions of years after the set. Millions of years. Hello? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. I think we're having some technical difficulties. Um, Who else is online? Okay, Naba. Can you hear me, guys, now? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, good. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> I actually don't know which part I was I was cut off, but I was, uh, I, I, I just went on with my time. I didn't stop that. Anyway, if I may continue. So, many um, strata are also too tightly bent. In many mountainous areas, strata thousands of feet thick are bent and folded into hairpin shapes. The conventional... Geologic time scale says these formations were deeply buried and solidified for hundreds of millions of years before they were bent. Yet, the folding occurred without cracking, um, with radii so small that the entire formation had to still be wet and then solidified when the bending occurred. So this implies that the folding occurred less than thousands of years after deposition. I can also talk about the the geologic column. It doesn't exist. It don't need the only place in the in the world where you can find it is in the textbooks. Um, there's nowhere that you can find that anywhere on Earth. Then you also find protein molecules in dinosaur. Um, protein molecules can't last long, but they're found inside unfossilized dinosaur bones, blood cells, blood vessels, where their contents could be squeezed out. Hemoglobin, actin, uh, tubulin, collagen, histones, um, the DNA it packages in order for the DNA. They've been found in fossil bones. A 2005 Science Magazine article showed transparent branching flexible blood vessels and red blood cells alongside soft and stretchy ligaments from a supposedly 
68 million old um, T-Rex bone. This uh, remarkable discovery was uh, by a uh, an uncreationist, actually an evolutionist, a paleontologist, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, and it rocked the scientific world. There's also the salinity level in oceans. Every year, um, rivers and other sources dump about 450 million tons of sodium into the ocean. But only 27% of the sodium manages to get back out of the sea each year. As far as anyone knows, the remainder simply accumulates in the ocean. So if the sea had no sodium to start with, it could have accumulated its present um, amount in less than 42 million years at today's input and output rates. This is, this is much less than the evolutionary age of the ocean. Um, which is 3 billion oh, years. The usual reply to this discrepancy is the past sodium inputs are simply less and outputs greater. However, calculations that are generous as possible to evolutionary scenarios still give a maximum age of only 62 million years. Calculations for many other seawater elements give much younger ages for the ocean. Uh, I'm going to skip the absence of massive, massive numbers of human skeletons. I'll, I'll go now to the carbon dating issues. So carbon-14 specifically, radiocarbon. It is a radioactive isotope of carbon with a nucleus containing um, six protons and eight neutrons. So most carbon is actually carbon-12, but we see traces of carbon-14 in objects uh, supposedly uh, million years old, millions of years old or billions of years old, for example, diamonds. Um, but C-14 has, can decay spontaneously, very unstable, into nitrogen over a period of a few thousand years. One half of carbon disappears every 5,730 years. So um, that's a big, of course, uh, puzzle for, for, for secularists. Um, and then there's helium in the uh, atmosphere as well. Helium is a chemical element with the uh, symbol HE and atomic number two. Um, it is a colorless, odorless, tasteless, non-toxic, inert monatomic gas that heads the noble gas group. Most of the helium in the atmosphere comes from radioactive decay, also known as nuclear decay, the process by which a nucleus of an um, unstable atom loses energy by emitting particles of ionizing radiation. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hear me. All right. And then there's also um, genetic entropy. There's a book written by Dr. Jan Sa John Sanford called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. Simply summarized, the genome is degenerating. There's no new information being created. We're actually losing information. Things are slowing down. In the far future, we'll experience gene death, and the humans won't have enough to survive. Um, any well-informed population geneticist understands that man is degenerating. There was actually uh, an evolutionist who was wondering, and he said, why, why aren't we dead a hundred times over? The genetic entropy, we should have been dead a very long time ago. Well, the human race is degenerating at about 1 to 5 percent per generation. There's no prospect for any type of scientific breakthrough to significantly extend our lifespan beyond what it is. Romans 8.22 actually talks about that. We know that the whole creation has been growing in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So in human genetic entropy, you have uh, 60 to 175 new mutations per person. You have tens of thousands of bad mutations, 2 to 3 percent of babies, uh, visible birth defects, and then thousands of genetic disease. Okay, so those are the evidences. Now, uh, there's also a problem, of course, with uh, the young Earth, and it's called distant starlight. How come that if we're only 6,000 years old, we see uh, stars that are supposed to be uh, billions of light years away? So... Um, it's, uh, it's seemingly it's an intractable problem, but there are possible solutions that have been proposed by creationists. Uh, they're not in agreement, but I don't have a problem with that. Uh, they, they base it on physics. Um, um, they always invoke the general relativity theory of Einstein. For example, the uh, gravitational time dilation proposed by Dr. Russell Priest. Another time dilation proposed by um, uh, Dr. John Hartnett. And then Dr. Jason Lyle also proposes the ASC, or the Anisotropic Synchrony Convention. So now I'm going to talk with the one and a half minute time that I have. I'm going to talk about the problems also of the Big Bang because it's the standard cosmological model. Well, it's the standard, it's the prevailing cosmological model for the early development of the universe. According to the theory, the Big Bang occurred approximately 13.82 billion years ago, which is considered the age of the universe. Well, yeah. 
guess what? There are actually thousands of the theories on the Big Bang, not just one. But theories, of course, are important in science, but theories are just people's um, constructs, their interpretation of the facts. We look at the same facts, we make our own theories based on our own starting points and presuppositions. There are many problems with the Big Bang. Um, for example, um, conservation of angular momentum, I've mentioned that earlier. Um, it's unable to explain where the loss of gravity and inertia uh, came from. It doesn't explain why the laws are consistent. It doesn't explain how um, it breaks the law of conservation of energy and mass. Um, and, and just a whole lot of uh, problems, like where do the four universal forces come from, for example? The weak ener- uh, nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, gravitation, electromagnetic force. Um, there's just all sorts of problems with the Big Bang, but um, since my time is limited, so I'll just say that, again, the young Earth um, creation model is scientifically verifiable, as I've mentioned with the evidences. It's viable a viable alternative to the prevailing um, cosmological model, which is the Big Bang. Thank you. Thank you very much po, Sir Eric. Uh, ready na ba tayo sa susunod na, ano, na part? Don? Okay. Maraming, maraming na rin na i-present si Sir Eric. Sana yung mga gustong magtanong, ihanda na nila later on para may raise yung question sa kanya. While we're waiting for, ano, for kay Don, siguro maganda hikayatin natin si Rick na next time mag-present talaga siya ng mga love issues. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, para ata may technical difficulty pa si John, uh, ikakat ko na muna itong call, tapos uh, I will call yung group call ulit, tapos baka maka-join si Don, hindi lang kasi siya maka-join sa call. Okay, uh, so na- medyo commercial break lang muna, and then when we come back si Don na. Oh, ikat ko lang mo. Okay. okay. Yeah. And of course, when they lose mass, they can't go on forever, as they have no new source of new mass, so it just gets evaporated away. When you see comets that uh, have gone behind the sun, usually they don't reappear. They're totally obliterated in one pass. They don't survive. It's like walking into a sauna and it's nice and warm and you see some ice cream cones just starting to melt. You know, they haven't been there very long. Comets are another indication of the youth of the solar system. But secular scientists seem to have a rescuing device for that. They say that, well, they know that comets can't last long. So they figure, well, there must be a comet generator somewhere in the solar system that makes new ones. And they call it the Oort cloud, which is an uh, invented idea that tries to explain why we still have comets in a solar system that's supposed to be Uh, billions of years old. The idea is that there's this vast reservoir of potential comets out there orbiting way beyond where we can detect them. And that every now and then, one of them gets thrown into the inner solar system and it becomes a brand new comet. Well, that's pretty clever, but there's no evidence for it. The only evidence you'll find it for an old cloud is in the textbooks. But you won't find it in the actual universe. Next, we have uh, spiral galaxies. Spiral galaxies are beautiful to watch, but not all galaxies are spiral. Some of them have a more elliptical shape, but a lot of them are spiral. Well, these spiral arms, they rotate differentially, which means that the inner portions rotate fast, while the outer, uh, outer portions rotate slower. So what, what would you think, then, is the galaxy would have to be twisting itself up or winding itself up tighter and tighter, which means the spiral structure gets tighter with every rotation. Well, it turns out that in 6,000 years, it hasn't rotated even once. Um, But if these galaxies are billions of years old, it would be a huge problem because they'd be twisted beyond recognition. There was actually a computer uh, simulation done by Dr. Jason Lyle of uh, Institute for Creation Research. He's a Christian astrophysicist. astrophysicist. And uh, he uh, wrote a computer simulation to use the actual velocities that they've measured in the galaxies to simulate what they would look like. In one billion years, well, they're totally unrecognizable. You won't see a spiral structure. So this proves that even just after one billion years, you can no longer have spiral arms. So again, it proves that the biblical time scale is right. There are other problems there, but uh, for in the interest of time, I just would skip perhaps if there are questions later, I can answer them. Let's also talk about Jupiter's external um, excess internal heat. Jupiter, which is about 10 Earths across, emits twice as much energy as it receives from the sun. Such a process can at last billions of years. It's like taking a potato out of a microwave. It's nice and warm, and it radiates the heat out in space. 
but it can't do that forever because it's only got so much energy, so it cools off. For a potato, it doesn't take that long. Jupiter, Jupiter is a much bigger potato. If it's billions of years old, why is it not an icicle right now? The problem is even worse for Neptune, which gives up 2.7 times heat as it receives from the sun. So why is it relatively warm if it's billions of years old? Another um, huge evidence that a lot of creationists use for, to prove the, uh, a young Earth, a young universe, is the magnetic field decay, the, the decay or the decrease of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, it's, an, it's an exponential decay. Everybody knows, uh, well, most of us know that the Earth has a magnetic field around it. Now, this magnetic field around the Earth acts as a barrier to protect us from UV uh, radiation. A lot of stuff is coming off the sun and it starts behind, besides just light. A lot of this UV light and the high energy um, radiation hits the magnetic field and is deflected to the poles, which is what causes the northern lights and the southern lights. We call them aurora um, borealis, aus, uh, aurora australis. Well, this magnetic field protects the Earth, but studies have shown consistently that the magnetic field is getting weaker and weaker. We are slowly losing the magnetic field. This means it used to be stronger, obviously. There's a limit to how strong it can be, or life cannot exist here. It can actually rip the iron out of your blood. If you made the magnetic field 30 or 40 times stronger than it is now, the heat generated would destroy everything. You could not have life on Earth with a lot stronger magnetic field. You run it back to creation um, week, which is about 6,000 years ago, and it's okay. But run it back a million years, and it's a big problem. Um, the magnetic fields of the giant planets like Jupiter and Uranus are consistent with a biblical time scale. Why is Jupiter's magnetic field so strong if it's billions of years old? When the Voyager 2 spacecraft flew past the planets Uranus and Neptune and measured their magnetic field and confirmed that it's consistent with the thousands of years of decay. Dr. Russ Humphreys, another creationist, is a physicist, um, actually predicted the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune before they were measured by the Voyager 2 spacecraft. And he based his measurements on the age of 6,000 years. The, ma the measurements made by Voyager 2 were consistent with Dr. Humphreys. That's real science right there. If you want to get the correct answer, you better start with the truth of God's word. Um, secular scientists, of course, were perplexed with that thought that there must be a recharging mechanism that builds up the magnetic fields again. But that, of course, falls under the realm of um, theoretical physics. There's the faint sun paradox, main sequence stars. The sun is a main sequence star, and main sequence stars have a 10 billion year lifetime maximum. If the sun is a main sequence star 4.5 billion years old, about half of its hydrogen would have been converted to helium. As the hydrogen is used up, the sun gets hotter. If the sun has evolved, it is now nearly 40% brighter than it would have been 4.5 billion years ago. So this has consequences, obviously, for the temperatures of the planets. Uh, it is generally believed that even small fluctuations in the sun's luminosity or brightness would have um, devastating consequences on the Earth's climate. Um, there's another one, cons conservation of angular momentum, which I'll probably just discuss later if I have time. I'm going to go to geology now. We also find polystrate fossils. The word polystrate, uh, from the word poly means multiple, and straight means the strata. Um, we find petrified trees uh, standing straight up, and they're running through many layers of rock strata. Now think about that for a minute. If those layers are different ages, you've only got two choices. Either the, th the tree stood there for millions and millions of years and didn't rot or fall down, or it grew through 75 feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. Which do you prefer? So that's uh, also huge evidence for uh, young Earth. And then the Grand Canyon. Um, it shows that the geologic time is imaginary. You know, when you visit the Grand Canyon, I haven't been there yet. I want to be there someday. So when visitors go to the Grand Canyon, they hear the usual geological interpretation involving millions of years. We are told, for example, that the horizontal formation at the bottom, the, the Tapiat sandstone, was deposited 550 million years ago, and the Kaibab limestone that forms the rim is 250 million years old. Um, well, interestingly, the Grand Canyon strata extends over about 400 kilometers into the eastern part of Arizona. Uh, there, they are at least 1,600 uh, meters lower in elevation. Supposedly, the uplift of the Grand Canyon area occurred about 70 million years ago, hundreds of millions of years after the set. Millions of years. Hello? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. I think we're having some technical difficulties. Um, who else is online?
Uh, okay, good. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> I actually don't know which part I was uh, was cut off, but I was uh, I, I I just went on with my time. I didn't stop. Yeah. Anyway, if I may continue, so many um, strata are also too tightly bent. In many mountainous areas, strata thousands of feet thick are bent and folded into hairpin shapes. The conventional geologic time scale says these formations were deeply buried and solidified for hundreds of millions of years before they were bent. Yet, the folding occurred without cracking, um, with radii so small that the entire formation had to still be wet and then solidified when the bending occurred. So this implies that the folding occurred less than thousands of years after deposition. I can also talk about the, the geologic column. It doesn't exist. It, the, only, the only place in the, in the world where you can find it is in the textbooks. Um, there's nowhere that you can find that anywhere on Earth. Then you also find protein molecules in dinosaur. Um, protein molecules can't last long. But they're found inside unfossilized dinosaur bones, blood cells, blood vessels, where their contents could be squeezed out. Hemoglobin, actin, uh, tubulin, collagen, histones, um, the DNA packages and orders, the DNA, they've been found in fossil bones. A 2005 Science Magazine article showed transparent branching flexible blood vessels and red blood cells alongside soft and stretchy ligaments from a supposedly... 68 million year old um, T-Rex bone. This uh, remarkable discovery was uh, by a, uh, an uncreationist, actually, an evolutionist, a paleontologist, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, and it rocked the scientific world. There's also the salinity level in oceans. Every year, um, rivers and other sources dump about 450 million tons of sodium into the ocean, but only 27% of the sodium manages to get back out of the sea each year. As far as anyone knows, the remainder simply accumulates in the ocean. So if the sea had no sodium to start with, it could have accumulated its present um, amount in less than 42 million years at today's input and output rates. This is, this is much less than the evolutionary age of the ocean, um, which is 3 billion years. The usual reply to this discrepancy is the past sodium inputs must have been less and outputs greater. However, calculations that are generous as possible to evolutionary scenarios still give a maximum age of only 62 million years. Calculations for many other seawater elements give much younger ages for the ocean. Uh, I'm going to skip the absence of massive, massive numbers of human skeletons. I'll, I'll go now to the carbon dating issues. So carbon-14 specifically, a radiocarbon. It is a radioactive isotope of carbon with a nucleus containing um, six protons and eight neutrons. So most carbon is actually carbon-12, but we see traces of carbon-14 in objects uh, supposedly a uh, million years old, millions of years old or billions of years old, for example, diamonds. Um, but C14 has, can decay spontaneously, very unstable, into nitrogen over a period of a few thousand years. One half of carbon... This appears every 5,730 years. So um, that's a big, of course, uh, puzzle for, for, for secularists. Um, and then there's helium in the uh, atmosphere as well. Helium is a chemical element with the symbol HE and atomic number 2. Um, it is a colorless, odorless, tasteless, non-toxic, inert monatomic gas that heads the noble gas group. Most of the helium in the atmosphere comes from radioactive decay, also known as nuclear decay, the process by which a nucleus of an um, unstable atom loses energy by emitting particles of ionizing radiation. Uh, can you guys hear me? All right. And then there's also um, genetic entropy. There's a book written by Dr. Jan San John Sanford called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. Simply summarized, the genome is degenerating. There's no new information being created. We're actually losing information. Things are slowing down. In the far future, we'll experience gene death, and the humans won't have enough to survive. Um, any well-informed population geneticist understands that man is degenerating. There was actually uh, an evolutionist who was wondering, and he said, why, why aren't we dead a hundred times over? The genetic entropy, we should have been dead a very long time ago. 
Well, the human race is degenerating at about 1% to 5% per generation. There's no prospect for any type of scientific breakthrough to significantly extend our lifespan beyond what it is. Romans 8.22 actually talks about that. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So in human genetic entropy, you have uh, 60 to 175 new mutations per person. You have tens of thousands of bad mutations, 2 to 3% of babies, uh, visible birth defects, and then thousands of genetic disease. Okay, so those are the evidences. Now, uh, there's also a problem, of course, with uh, the young Earth, and it's called distant starlight. How come that if we're only 6,000 years old, we see uh, stars that are supposed to be uh, billions of light years away? So... Um, it's, uh, it's, it's seemingly it's an intractable problem, but there are possible solutions that have been proposed by creationists. So they're not in agreement, but I don't have a problem with that. Uh, they, they base it on physics. Um, um, they always invoke the general relativity theory of Einstein. For example, the uh, gravitational time dilation proposed by Dr. Russell Fries, another time dilation proposed by um, uh, Dr. John Hartnett, and then Dr. Jason Lyle also proposes the ASC, or the Anisotropic Synchrony Convention. So now I'm going to talk with the one and a half minute time that I have. I'm going to talk about the problems also of the Big Bang because it's the standard cosmological model. Well, it's the standard, it's the prevailing cosmological model for the early development of the universe. According to the theory, the Big Bang occurred approximately 13.82 billion years ago, which is considered the age of the universe. Well, yeah. Guess what? There are actually thousands of the theories on the Big Bang, not just one. But theories, of course, are important in science, but theories are just people's um, constructs, their interpretation of the facts. We look at the same facts, we make our own theories based on our own starting points and presuppositions. There are many problems with the Big Bang. Um, for example, um, conservation of angular momentum, I mentioned that earlier. Um, it's unable to explain where the loss of gravity and inertia uh, came from. It doesn't explain why the laws are consistent. It doesn't explain how um, it breaks the law of conservation of energy and mass. Um, and, and just a whole lot of uh, problems, like where did the four universal forces come from, for example? The weak ener uh, nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, gravitation, electromagnetic force. Um, there's just all sorts of problems with the Big Bang, but... Um, since my time is limited, so I'll just say that Again, the young Earth um, creation model is scientifically verifiable, as I've mentioned with the evidences. It's viable, a viable alternative to the prevailing um, cosmological model, which is the Big Bang. Thank you. Thank you very much, po, Sir Eric. Uh, ready na ba tayo sa susunod na, ano, na part? Don? Hello? Okay, check lang natin if online na si... Okay, maraming, maraming na rin na i-present si Sir Eric. Sana yung mga gustong magtanong, ihanda na nila later on para may raise yung question sa kanya. While we are waiting for, ano, for kay Don, siguro maganda hikayatin natin si Rick na next time mag-present talaga siya ng mga love issues. Yes. Okay, so medyo commercial break lang muna and then when we come back si Don na. Okay. okay. We back. Is it commercial break? Hello. 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 Yes, good afternoon. Sorry. Hindi ako maka-join kanina. Po. Good evening everybody. Ah, uh, nakaano naman, naka-headphones naman ako. And there. Okay. Narinig nyo ba ako? Narinig yes. nyo ako? Or yes. Ako? Narinig nyo ako? Yes. Okay. Okay, so Mr. Don Paez, please proceed now with your opening statement and your main argument. Yes, good uh, uh, Good evening everybody. Um, so sorry for the delay kanina. Yes, hello? May interrupt lang kita. May interrupt lang kita. Actually, you now have ano, 25 minutes kasi... You didn't. You were not able to do the opening statements kanina, so now you have two parts, yung five minutes na opening statements, tapos 20 minutes na main argument discussion. I see, I see. That's good, that's good. Okay naman siya. So, ayun, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me clearly? 
Hello? Yes, we can oh, hear hello. you loud Very and clear. clear. Okay. Oh, see, yeah, I was afraid Very na na naman ako. Anyway, good evening, everybody. I'm here to discuss um, on the proposition that the... Um, Standard cosmological model is actually a very, very good um, scientific theory and we did not replace it just yet, especially not with the creationist model. So I am coming from the experience of, uh, from the background of philosophy, specifically the philosophy of science, which mainly deals with the problem of demarcation. In other words, how do we know whether, whether a theory is scientific or not? Or how do we know whether a theory is true or not? Because those two are very different things. Not all true things are scientific. Not all scientific things are true. So we need to be able to establish first what science means and what truth means to science. But before we do that, let me just first give a background about um, the standard model of cosmology. I have uploaded a file, a PowerPoint file, which you may download, I think, from the event page so that you can be able to follow my lecture because, um, admittedly, it's not as straightforward because we're going to deal with some concepts that are related to theoretical physics and some concepts that are related to philosophy. So my presentation is this, uh, as titled Lambda CDM or the... Um, Standard model. It's a debate on cosmology. If we go back to historical analysis, we'll see two theories about the universe. Because cosmology is about the universe itself. If it were about specific items in the universe, like stars, planets, galaxies, that would simply be astronomy. Cosmology is about the structure, the origins, the eventual fate of the universe itself. So we have two theories or cosmological worldviews with regards to the universe. First is from the ancient Greeks, we have what we call the eternal universe, which has really... Classy, Sir Don. Oh. I'm going to drop my kid, no? I'll drop it. I think it must be because of his internet connection. Okay. Ayan. Okay, we will call you again, Don. Don't worry. Yes, we can hear. We, I can hear you, Omar. Hi, yeah, okay, na. Uh, I now hear you guys. Don, okay, are you so, there already? Yeah. Yes, I'm already here. Apparently, for the moment. <laughs> All right. So, as I was talking Please about earlier, nothing. when you talk about uh, specific items in the universe. Yes, yes. Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Okay. When we're talking about specific items in the universe, that would be astronomy. So there are two competing theories with regards, with regards to cosmology itself or the universe. First is that from the ancient Greeks, they believe that the universe is eternal. So there is no physical beginning of the universe. The universe just is. There means there's no creator. Despite having several gods or a pantheon, uh, these gods were just superhuman. Okay? They are not all-powerful. They are not creators. They are just more, more powerful beings than humans. The second theory about cosmology is that we have a finite universe. Now, having a finite universe usually has uh, an implication that it has a creator god. And this is mostly for the religious account of creation. Now, the primary theory of how everything came to be was that First of all, we didn't know what happened in the beginning, but we do know that there is matter throughout the universe and that this matter attracts each other because of gravity. Thus, we are able to get the nebular hypothesis. This is a mechanistic theory of how solar systems and galaxies existed after matter was formed. In here, gas clouds or nebulae um, clump together because of gravity, thus producing stars and planets. They produce stars because they attracted enough material to be able to form a critical mass so that things got hot enough for nuclear fusion to take place and planets and other items in the, in the universe clumped together for matter which did not, did not react with each other. This theory was developed by Immanuel Swedenborg in the 1730s and Immanuel Kant enhanced it in 1755. 
However, Pierre Laplace also uh, independently developed it in 1796. So this was during the 18th century. Now we come back to, we go to Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, despite being a theist, actually believed that the universe had, that it had an eternal past. He did not believe that the universe had a beginning. Okay. Now, but here's the thing. He believed in gravity. And he actually thought that gravity would attract everything towards the given center. If the universe was not eternal, then everything would res just result in a big crunch. If that would not be true, then either, one, Newton's theory of gravity would be wrong, which is, I don't think he would be admitting to that. The second is that the universe is not eternal. But there is a third option, that the universe has no center, that the structure of the universe is infinite. With no center of gravity to go to, then everything would be pulling everything from everywhere. In other words, they don't need to gravitate towards a specific point. Newton argued that because the universe was eternal, then by virtue of that, the universe must also be infinite. In other words, he, had, he was able to argue for an eternal universe, even without matter clumping together and forming a big crunch. Now enter the picture of Albert Einstein. He forwarded the theory of general relativity and how it affects space-time. He says that mass curves space-time and affects the interaction of objects with its air of, within its area of influence. In other words, or to be short, in his theory, he computed that even in an infinite universe, matter must collapse under gravity. So he proposed that since the universe has not collapsed yet, in 1917, he proposed a value called lambda, which we now call the cosmological constant, to keep the universe from collapsing on itself. It is a force that negates the force of gravity that the planets, the stars, and everything in the universe exerts from each other. You could treat this as some sort of negative gravity that exists between the space of planets that pushes them apart. Now, there was a great debate in 1920s. The National Academy of Science had um, Harlow Shapley and also Herbert Curtis debate on um, whether uh, when the size of the universe and whether all the other nebula were part of the Milky Way. In this era, nebulae were also, ga uh, galaxies were also considered nebula. They focus on a particular nebula, M31, or in our understanding, this is the Andromeda galaxy. They um, Harlow Shapley proposed that M31 on Andromeda must be included in the Milky Way. Why? Because if it were not included in the Milky Way, the sheer size of it would, be, would make it uh, so very far. It would be 10 billion light years away. During that time, astronomy was not ready to accept such a big universe. Okay? So also, uh, he based his theories on Adrian Van Manen's observation that in, the, in Andromeda, there were stars that are called uh, that uh, there are stars that are very bright that are rotating. So if they are rotating, then that means if the galaxy is so fast, they would not be able to rotate. This means that the galaxy is small enough to belong within the Milky Way. On the other hand, Herbert Curtis argued that M31 was not part of the Milky Way, but a different galaxy, or what we call an island universe. Because in this time, you have to understand that the galaxy... Hello, Homer. Na mukhang na-call drop ulit si Don. Galit ya. 